Hello and welcome to Leaders in Learning, a thought leadership series that explores the business of learning. Trends, challenges, best practices, hot takes, all things learning are up for discussion. I'm Shauna David, your host, and it's my absolute privilege to sit down with today's guest, who is a longtime industry leader and principal architect of the world's largest global study of HR, talent, and workplace trends. Josh Burson is synonymous with L&D and HR. He is the thought leader when it comes to corporate HR, training, talent management, recruiting, leadership, and workplace technology. And we're going to talk about all of it in today's episode. Hi, Josh. Hi, Shana. How are you? Great. I'm very excited to be able to talk to you and chat more on your perspectives and how learning is evolving in the workplace and beyond. But I want to start with you and your background. You've had a very interesting career. So tell me a little bit about it. I don't think it's that interesting. Really? <laughs> well, show's over then, guys. <laughs> no, really, I would love to learn a bit more about your career journey and specifically your most recent endeavor. Tell me a bit about how you came to launch and why Josh Burgesson Academy and why now? Well, uh, I spent 20 years in tech and sales and marketing and product management before I got involved in HR and learning. Then during the 2000 uh, dot-com layoff period, I became an industry analyst because there were no jobs at that point in time. Studied online learning in, starting in 1998. In 1998, we didn't have a name for the internet yet, and we started to come up with this idea of e-learning, which was taking instructor-led training by teachers and putting it online into, at the time, flash video. Flash is now gone. And I realized that companies were really struggling to figure out how to do this, why to do it, in what format, what topics, how to arrange it. And I basically learned through those years all of the infrastructure and tools and methodologies and crazy ideas that people were doing to try to train and teach people over the internet. Now it became a huge market, of course, for primary, secondary education, corporate training, professional development, on and on and on. And so um, it's been a great experience for me to learn and share this with corporations around the world and, and try to show people through research what is possible and what's going to work. In my particular case, as I was doing this and meeting lots and lots of HR professionals, I realized that the HR profession was lacking in this exact type of solution. So when I left Deloitte in 2018, I thought to myself, maybe I should build an academy of professional development for HR. And that's what we've been doing for the last three or four years. That's wonderful. And it sounds like disruption, the internet was where you started. And I think we can both agree that that disruption continues till today. Right? It's, it's happening now more than ever. In fact, I think it's right this minute, it's happening very, very quickly. I agree, right? Global supply chain disruptions, talent shortages, skill gaps, disruptive technology again. And you've been quoted to say that, you know, organization's biggest barrier to growth is a lack of talent and skills. How should organizations start tackling this? Unfortunately, a lot of companies in the last decade or two really thought of training as an expense. And many times during an economic downturn, they would cut it. I think we're past that. I think we're in a period of time now where there are going to be labor shortages and skills gaps and accelerating shortages of new skills in every single company. And companies are moving into new industries and companies are adopting new technologies. So the, the pace of this is faster and faster and faster. And if you don't build the skills internally, you have to go out and try to hire them. And they're very expensive to hire because the, your competitors want the same skills you do. So internal development of people is a C-level issue now, and it retains people. When you interview people about why they left their company, 90% of the time they say, I wasn't going anywhere, I wasn't growing, I wasn't learning, my career wasn't moving ahead. So this is a really, really critical investment, not an expense. And the companies that continuously invest in training, learning and development, career management, and all those areas get a huge return. Sometimes they don't measure it, but they do get it. And so it's changed a lot. I, I would say when I started doing this, it wasn't considered that strategic by many, many companies. Mm -hmm. You are right to say that there has been a shift in the way employees perceive the value of the training they receive from an organization and the perspective from the C-level of it being an enabler versus a budget constraint, some draft within the organization. But I think one thing that you mentioned around the human nature of people wanting to learn and wanting 
to grow their career is something that has existed from the dawn of humanity, right? And I, the reality is the way that we work has changed so much. You talk a lot about this and the impact of the Industrial Revolution, how it evolved, systems of work, the way that we organize ourselves. And I would argue we're in the midst of one of those big moments of revolution today. And perhaps you agree. I've heard you coin and talk about it in the terms of the intelligence age. Yep. And I'd love if you could expand on that a little bit. Maybe give us some color about what are the things that organizations need to be doing today so that they are ready for it tomorrow and down the road. I mean, I think there's a pretty important history lesson for everybody to think about, and that is what we call the industrial age and the post-industrial age. Most of the artifacts we have in companies, the way we hire people, the way we train people, the way we create jobs and job descriptions and job competencies, is really goes back to the early days of industrial corporations in the early days of manufacturing companies, automobile companies, oil companies, where we had fixed jobs and we would hire people into the jobs and we could replace people in and out of the jobs. And those jobs would develop, you know, would be part of a manufacturing process that would scale and scale and scale. And companies made money by selling more and more and more of the same thing at an increasingly higher margin. And the people were really a cog in that wheel to making that industrial machine work. Now fast forward a hundred years to where we are today, every company is in the business of services, of intellectual property, of creativity, of software, of some form of human-led product and service. So people now are the product in most companies, not all CEOs see it that way. Given that, somebody's skills, somebody's engagement with the company, their understanding of the business processes in their company, their understanding of the customers is essential to the company's growth. It's not a nice to have so that the machine will run. It's very, very different. Now on the human side, as you mentioned, Shana, the way I think about it is we are learning animals by nature. From the minute you're born, you're learning. You're learning how to talk and eat and walk and read and speak and on and on and on. And so when a company provides great training and education, by the way, also to their customers, because their customers are looking for the same thing on behalf of the products you sell them. Customers are more educated, more intense. Yeah, I mean, so you people are happy. So there's an engagement issue here. There's a performance issue. People feel committed to the company because the company is investing in them. And, you know, I look at training as, if you think about it as an investment instead of an expense, what you really do is investing in people as an appreciating asset as opposed to a machine, which is a depreciating asset. So learning and development is the investment in the people that makes them better performers, higher productive people, more creative, better with customers, and so forth. You know, companies that cut this training and don't take it seriously just don't understand this new world. This is the world. This is the economic world we live in now. Right. The model you described of the assembly line, the John Coffey book that led to that, very different than the reality we operate in today. I 100% agree. So what I heard you say is that shift from the C-level perspective of understanding that it is an investment, you are going to appreciate a return on investment and that human value will grow exponentially as, similar to a garden perhaps as you water it mm-hmm. and that same can be true from your perspective for customers as well who are happier they recognize that the the business they've purchased from is investing to continue to maintain their engagement. I think a lot of learning and development professionals are internal to the company, but there's actually a market that's just as big in training and educating customers to use the product or the service that you sell them better and better and better. And that is a huge value proposition for them and a revenue generating source for the company. So that's another you know, way to think of training as a very strategic part of a business. Yes, it's a strategic revenue driver. Right. right. And that's an interesting space for many HR practitioners, folks that have, are in L&D, but from an HR background. Right. I think the key that folks need help with, and I'm hoping you can give some advice, is how do you better, more effectively collaborate with the business so that you have shared outcomes, shared goals? Well, in terms of the professionals in HR, I think they just need to spend time in the business so they realize how important this is. But the real way to build this this relationship, this partnership, is what we call a federated operating model, which means that not all of the learning and development training can be done by corporate training people. There are salespeople, there are service people, there are manufacturing people. All of the great ideas are happening out there. Now, there are some topics that really have to be done centrally, but, but learning and development, probably more than any other area of HR, is a 
partnership between local line leaders and operational people and the L&D people that might be developing content, developing a system, curating it, and so forth. And if that relationship works, then the ROI of training is massively high and everybody in the company appreciates it. When it's too centralized and too bureaucratic and too focused on what the HR people think people need, yes. people complain about it, they don't use it, it doesn't quite meet their needs, and the investment is, is less, the, the ROI is lower. That relevancy, the connection to the front line and where the work is happening, like in lean manufacturing, going to right. the Gemba, there's a critical nature. And so I appreciate that you are giving the advice to HR practitioners to go to where the work is, talk to employees, talk to leaders, talk to customers. And even more than that, a lot of the best teachers and educators and knowledge sources are in the line operation. The HR and training people don't really know the content. They're just there to facilitate the development and distribution of it. So if they're not engaged directly in the process, that's a bad sign. So how can organizations better adapt their system so that their work, their learning programs are more relevant to the business and that they are tied to those business objectives? And I think to your point on what's top of mind for employees who are looking to grow their skills in an uh, economy where opportunities aren't as clean as they used to be in some cases, and where executives are recognizing the pain of labor shortages, talent gaps, and can see that it could get potentially a lot worse. What advice do you have for organizations to start solving the upskilling? And I'm also wondering if you can give us a bit of descriptive language to help our audience. How do you define some of these terms, upskilling, reskilling? Maybe give me a little color on that. Well, you know, I don't like using jargony terms like that very much, to be honest, uh, because I really think the most successful training initiatives are solutions to problems. So we like to start with the, a, another idea, which is fall in love with the problem, not with the solution. What there's a tendency to do in L&D is we have all these tools and systems and methodologies and we spray them around and hope people will consume them. And there's some of that that just has to happen, but the really high value work is when a business unit head or a business leader has a performance problem, has a turnover problem, has a quality problem, and the HR or L&D team acts as a consultant and they diagnose what the problem is. It may not be a learning problem, by the way, but it could be. Right. And, and then they interview the people and get to know what's really going on, and they develop interventions that might be formal training, they might be job aids, they might be tools, they might be you know, education of individuals or specialists, you know, tapping into the information from the business itself on what's not working, and then distribute that in a way that people get it, that people can learn it before they have the problems, and then they get high ROI. Of course, you can't do that in a custom way for every employee in the company, so. Not yet, at least. Well, AI will probably help that. So what happens in L&D is we try to build standardization of tools as much as we can, learning management systems, learning experience platforms, what I call academies, or skills-based programs that focus on things that we can repeat over and over again. Mm -hmm. But every, basically, learning problem is a combination of skills, information, experience, and access to people. What the magic is for L&D professionals is to take all these methodologies that we have and apply them well to the problem at hand, rather than just spray them around everywhere and assume that they're gonna work for everybody, because sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Right, and it is like a, a palette, right? Using yep. the appropriate color, the shades, to be able to solve the problem. And it can be challenging, because for many L&D professionals, some of those methodologies are so core to the way they do it. I wanna just reinforce something you said, though. First, you gotta focus on the problem and not right. the solution. And often, there's a perception that training is the answer, but it could be compensation leadership so there's a lot of right. human performance improvement things to look at it holistically and so I appreciate that call out for practitioners to zoom out when you when the business comes to you with the problem really dig in and identify is this a training problem and if so go forth be a consultant to the business leverage their insight and your expertise to solve that problem but if it's not that's okay too part of falling in love with the problem is not jumping to a solution too fast I mean if somebody came to a head of HR or a head of L&D and said we want you to build an AI academy for the whole company. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to understand AI. You might immediately start searching for courses, but maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe you ought to look at the different job roles and what their needs are, and maybe you ought to look at who needs to understand how to build AI, who needs to understand how to train AI, who needs to understand how to administer AI, and then who needs to understand how to use AI, and what is it they're going to use it for. And you know, if you spend a month or two digging in, you could build something way more useful 
than buying a bunch of courses and assuming your job is done. And I think there is a natural tendency in L&D because there's so much content off the shelf to say, well, we'll just bring a vendor in here and we'll just let them do it and you know, we'll just push the button. And, and check the box. Yeah, I mean, that has some value, but not nearly as much as getting involved in understanding the real problem. It's the jobs to be done, right? right. The skills assessment. Get close to the work, right? You right. can't have that deep understanding of your audience unless you follow the advice you gave well, us and, a little and, while and ago. Another point which you and I talked about earlier yeah. is the culture of the company. The way we teach safety at Chevron is not the same way as we teach safety at Apple or the same way we teach, teach safety at a software company. Maybe we don't teach it at all at a software company or maybe we teach them about algorithmic safely, safety. So if you're you know, in a hurry mm -hmm. and you want to build a training program and you're going to shop for somebody to sell you something, you, know, you may or may not be successful. So I, I really think that L&D professionals have much more impact on the culture than they realize because they bring people into a space where they expose their insecurities to learn. Mm -hmm. And so that anything they can learn about the way we do this here and what we value in this company is also really important in L&D programs. It's a great perspective and I think you know, onboarding is a critical component of the employee life cycle and I think in some cases undervalued in its potential to accelerate or evolve a culture and set that foundation. Make it clear to folks that you're going to invest in their career development. Give them access early to the customer education that you have in place so they as employees can familiarize themselves with the platform and product. And let's talk about technology a bit. It's going to continue to disrupt our lives. It always has from the printing press to today. And so what advice do you have? Or are there things that you would recommend to organizations learning professionals as they think about starting to bring in AI, automation, and weave it into their programs? Well, it's interesting. You know, I've been in technology for so long. I really think L&D is usually one of the most innovative groups of people relative to technology. Anything that's new, training people are playing with it. And, and that's actually the, the method you have to take. Video was new, you had to experiment with it. Social media was new, you had to experiment with it. YouTube, learning experience platforms, those were new yet experiment, experiment with it. AI, base learning, adaptive learning, all of these you know, sort of technologies that are floating around in the learning space, if you're not trying them, or if you're not experimenting with them, you could be missing out on a massive opportunity for your company. Now, not every, not every experiment's gonna work the first time, but I think L&D people tend to be good tinkerers. They learn about how these things work. And in the learning and development industry, the vendor market is just as innovative and creative as the training industry itself. So if you're willing to try some new things, you're gonna find innovative providers that are gonna give you things that sometimes really move the needle. I mean, VR is a perfect example. I remember in the very beginning of people playing around with virtual reality, it was slow and it was hard to do and it was very, very expensive. Video was the same way, by the way when I did it in the early 2000s. And now, if you look at the new Apple product that just came out and the stuff that's come out from Meta, it's gonna be more or less mainstream way of consuming content. So if you haven't been doing any experimenting with it, you're gonna have to catch up. I think learning and feel, feeling unintimidated by technology is a really important part of, of the training industry. I agree, and I, I suspect that if practitioners start to embed more of this technology, it'll help them get closer to the business. I'm talking about manufacturing, things right. where you really need simulations. You need to bring critical thinking and be able to pressure test the performance-based learning that you're trying to drive to. And I, I appreciate the opportunities and the way that potentially technology will help democratize some of the learning opportunities and help get it in the hands of more Well, and the other, the other reason technology is important is we as humans, as workers, behave differently now than we did before because of technology. If I think about the attention span people have now, you know, this, the t context switching we go through at work in our lives, our focus on video versus reading, some of these are social trends that affect everybody. L&D people need to understand that. So, you know, we used to build four to six to eight hour video courses that you step through page by page. No one is going to consume any of that today. We call that death <laughs> by next. But it didn't. Right? But it was hot in the 2000s. Yeah. In the early 2000s, it was yeah. unbelievable. So yeah. that's the reason, you know, being aware of what's going on in the technology industry is so important. It's so critical. I agree, and I suspect that it's going to continue. And so I always tell learning professionals that you've got to be the first one to do the learning, yep. make the mistakes, expose yourself to the new opportunities to improve the experience for your learners. And I 
appreciate that it's not always easy. Learning professionals, HR practitioners, they're in the weeds, they're solving big, big problems. And I know that many of them rely on knowledge from folks like you. You've got tons of methodologies, analogies, models, maturity models that help organizations navigate their growth, navigate how they adjust to the changes within their business. And so I think that's been very powerful. I mean, the reason we started the maturity models was exactly because of this. There is no right or wrong answer to any problem in HR and L&D. There's a thousand options. So when we do research and we look at what companies are doing on any particular topic, we'll run across all sorts of unbelievably successful things that are completely different from the last person we just talked to. And so what we try to do is we get a lot of information from a lot of companies and we kind of organize it into here's what beginners do if you've never done this before. Yes. Here's what advanced beginners do who have been doing it for a while. Here's what experts do and here's what the world-class, really experimental, leading-edge companies companies do. And what that does is it helps organizations feel comfortable uh, that they are in the right place because you can't jump from level one to level four overnight. If you've never used any of these advanced tools and technologies in L&D, you're not going to figure them all out in one day. It's probably a week. bad decision for your business to your right, point You're going to do it over time. Right. And, and these things keep changing because, I mean, the things that, <laughs> I mean, I have to laugh, the things that I worked on in L&D 10 or 15 years ago are so out of date now, they're almost worthless. So you've got to continuously look at this stuff and say, we got to throw that stuff away, redo it in the new modality with the new tech. Um, and that's why L&D is so much fun, frankly. That's why people enjoy living in that profession. That is very well said and true from my own personal experience. And I think these models and analogies will be more important as folks try to figure out this new world of AI. And I've heard some language from you and your team around autonomous learning. What does the vision of that autonomous learning look like? Well, okay, so I'm in my late 60s. I've been, I worked in the mainframe area. I, I worked in the PC era. I worked in the client server era. I worked in the internet, the cloud. I mean, I've lived through all of these technological changes. I really believe that AI is as big as any of the other transformations that have happened. This particular type of technology, which is certainly never going to stop being developed, but it's very, very good now, can amass and understand and make sense of massive amounts of information in a human approachable way through prompting, through questions and answers. And training is ultimately a content problem. What most companies have is thousands of documents, compliance reports, rules, videos, strategy, human, documents. strategy documents, PowerPoints, yes. human beings that know things that they've never really shared with anybody else. Yes. And when we try to train somebody, we got to somehow find all that stuff and turn it into a course or some instructional object. And then the, and the person who's consuming it is skipping through the course, skipping the things they already know to try to find the stuff they need to know. AI is perfect for that. We can take massive amounts of information. We can assimilate it and reconstruct it into different objects that are easy to consume. And people can ask questions of the AI that they would normally ask an expert. And the reason I know this is works because this is what we did. We built a product called Galileo. We took all of our research for the last 22 years. We put it into this AI. We've been working on it for about a year. It is spectacularly good at answering any question about HR and giving you examples and tools and vendors and all that stuff that we do. We built an academy that also does this, but honestly, I think the academy will slowly be replaced by an AI also. Interesting. And so for L&D people that have been spending months and years building courses and content and assessments and simulations and videos, this is going to be miraculously different in the content development part of the business and then in the consumption side where people can ask questions of content and get answers. Uh, teaching assistants can be done automatically. Instructors can now be facilitators and content aggregators and content and trainers of the AI. I mean, there's just going to be a lot of change it's here. It's so cool. And when you yeah. talk about the operational efficiencies that you gain, when you, you earlier you mentioned federated learning as a way to balance the unique needs of localized areas with the central mission of an organization and the central repository well, well, of knowledge. Well, think about federated. So imagine we've got a manufacturing plant and we built a whole bunch of courses on how to do this, that, and the other thing and how to not break things. And somebody in the plant says, you know, I got an idea, I'm going to try something new. And they invent some new process for doing this. Do we have to wait for L&D to interview that person and add them to the course? No, we videotape that person talking about it, stick it in the AI, five minutes later it's available to everybody else. I mean, that was not possible before.
Not even close. And you're right that it's benefiting the learners who have relevant, consistent knowledge they can access 24-7. It's helpful for content developers who often have such a long list of priorities, it is impossible for them to tackle them all. And with this, you're going to augment that productivity internally. And I also think democratize the craft of learning. There are more people who will understand how to create great learning and how to access it through well, this technology. You know, I'm glad you feel that way because unfortunately, I also want to make one more point. I think Please. a lot of L&D people are freaking out that their jobs are <laughs> going to go away. And I don't think that's going to happen. Just like every other tool we've ever had from Dreamweaver to YouTube, once you figure out how to use it, you're going to apply your ingenuity to use it in new and different ways. We have to think about AI as a, a super powering tool for L&D professionals, not a replacement for the training function. I think we could have much simpler systems. We won't have so many back-end content systems in the right. future, but, but we're a ways off yet. There's a lot of creative thinking still yet to happen. Right. I agree with you, though, that the ability to make an impact as a learning professional can increase significantly because you're no longer tied to some of the historical, you need X amount of hours to create right. Y training right. program, right? I think that's going to unlock right. some of the potential of it's this It's going to be minutes, not hours anymore. Oh, that's great news. <laughs> but how does this how do you think about this in terms of globally distributed workforces? Like any advice on, considering you've had the pleasure of working with customers and clients across the world in many different shapes and sizes and organization, any advice on managing localized, unique characteristics well, to the global? So there's a, you know, the, the analogy that I use, because I've done this for so long, is there's a centrifugal force to training. You bring it into the center and it flings back out. It always happens because no matter how much you try to centralize things, you, you can't keep in touch with all the issues going on in different parts of the company. And what happens is they'll hire a training person or they'll take somebody on the line and say, hey, would you just train all us on what you just did? And then there goes five, five hours of their time. The magic really is for the learning and development professionals to operate and live in a local way and then decide as a group what you're going to centralize. So some local group comes up with some brilliant way to train people on some process or some issue that's going on. Do we let that sit there or do we make, the whole, make it available to the whole company? That actually works very, very well if you're all working together. The reason it's sometimes hard is this training department doesn't know about what this training department's doing. The corporate guys are working on something that nobody cares about. <laughs> So there's a lot of just getting to talk to each other and, and get to know each other. That also saves a lot of money because what will happen is this group brought a platform, this group brought yes. a platform. They're kind of the same platform, but they're from a different vendor. There's a content license over here. There's a content license over there. And they probably have similar content that they developed individually And then there's, and then there's stuff that, tra that people bought that they didn't classify as training that's actually training that's yeah. on the P&L, but you can't find it. This process of, of really trying to rationalize the L&D spend and, and the process is, a, is, a, is kind of a continuum as part of this domain. Even though centralization helps to clean up a lot of the confusion, you can't go too far. You have to just accept the fact that the most knowledgeable people about the problems to be solved are in the line operations, whatever that may be. And sometimes there's a learning business partner yeah. that works with them. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but, but that's the reality. But you're right that there is a tension between centralizing to gain efficiencies of systems and processes, because it's not only the individuals and how the organization has developed their learning learning programs. It really is about the processes by which all of this stuff comes together. So I agree that having that flexibility within a centralized framework can really be the difference maker for folks in businesses who are trying to solve this problem. Now, I know that many people draw on you and your team for expertise. That research you talked about, Galileo, all of these things have been game changers for many folks in many organizations. But is there someone that you go to get your insight? You know, I get all my good ideas from the clients. I really do. And the vendors. The solution providers come up with all sorts of creative things. They don't always know how good or bad that the new idea they have really is. And I think we give them a lot of feedback and we try to help them go to market. You know, I don't, I don't think there's any one person. I, I think I'm a very open-minded analyst. This, if you're an analyst, you have to be open-minded. I mean, you, a lot of people who are self-proclaimed gurus are very, very good at something, mm -hmm. but not everything. So I, I really don't have any one person, but, but I think most of my good ideas come from listening to lots of companies who've created and tried a lot of things and thinking to myself, I've seen this before, 
and here's what happens, and therefore I think there's a best practice, but we have to sort of make sense of it. I really think what I do and what we do, in some sense we're pattern matchers. We get all these sources of information from vendors and companies and different, you know, including people in the education industry and, and books and academics, and we kind of absorb it and we think about what is this telling us? What's the story here relative to making companies better? And that, that's really the work that we do. And so I hate to tell you this, I, there's no one person. It sounds like there's <laughs> many. So the learning yeah. guy is really, it sounds like you're just very open to learn I, lo from I the love folks. talking to learning professionals, chief learning officers, people that are dealing with this because they're always trying something new and inventing something all the time. So, so I think they're all sources of, of great, good, great, good ideas. So if you were to give one piece of advice to a C-suite executive who is worried about the impact of all of this disruptive technology, changing workforce, what's a question they should go internally and ask their team so that they can help solve this problem? Well, let me give you two. The first for the C-level is, do you believe and does your culture believe in learning or growth mindset or not? There are a lot of people in business who believe we're going to hire the expert. If they perform, great. If they don't perform, we'll find somebody who can perform. And that's a natural behavior in a high-performing company. Oh, training takes too long. This person will never learn that. They're not really very good at that because they're all working over here. You know, you have to essentially believe that every human being is capable of doing more and more and more under the right environment. And so that's number one. Sometimes that's called a learning culture. Sometimes it's called a growth mindset. In this day and age, I think if you don't believe that as, a, as an executive, your company's not going to be around forever. The second thing that I've learned over the years is that there is no one type of content, type of program, type of technology that does everything. When we were building our academy, which, you know, HR is a pretty complicated area, you know, I thought, okay, we'll build a bunch of courses. We'll get some videos of people talking about different topics. We'll have them, some assessments. No, we needed more than that. We needed group meetings. We needed uh, skills models. We needed best practice discussions. We needed a collaboration system. Every learning problem is very multifaceted. If you think about it as a single intervention that's going to suddenly solve something, it might work, but there'll be other things to think of. Let me just give you one funny example Please. of this. So years ago, I did a case study of Kinko's, which, which is gone. They're part of FedEx. And so Kinko's was you know, the copy center. Mm -hmm which now this is a, a big business, and somebody was building a course to teach people how to unjam the copiers. Okay, copiers used to jam a lot, they probably still do, and these are big, complicated copiers. So he was building this course, and he was getting people to take the course, and he realized nobody's taking the course, it's not helping, it's not moving the needle. He goes out and he visits all these copy centers, he says, we don't need a course, we need a piece of plastic on the side of the copier that shows you what to do when it jams. Now this sounds silly, but he didn't really think that way until he went out there and looked at it. So no one solution is necessarily going to fit all the time. So you kind of have to have a Swiss Army knife of, of tools at your disposal and bring them together as a whole. And that makes L&D complicated. But I think that's why most learning professionals are very, very creative people because they want to think about all these different aspects of learning. The, the way the human brain works is complex and we don't always know what the right answer is until we work on it. I believe you said something earlier that reigns true in this statement as well, and that's just that we are wired to learn, and we're wired for that community and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So any opinions on that tension between increasing emerging technology, more of us are working through screens, and the necessity of human connection, learning from each other. I'll tell you that the, uh, the balance that I, I, I think happens in most companies is desire to learn, desire to grow, desire to get promoted, desire to add more value, fear. I don't know how to do this. I'm going to fail. I don't want to ask this question. I, maybe I can't learn this after all. Maybe I didn't get enough education for this. Maybe I need a high advanced degree. We have to get over that. I really do believe from my own life and my own experience and my family and my friends that Everybody can learn more, um, and, and we, if, we, if we get rid of this fear factor, and by the way, a lot of that's cultural. A lot of companies have sort of barriers, artificial barriers between people moving to new roles or advancing to new. We can unleash this creative opportunity in companies and remove the fear. I mean, I've had this conversation with a lot of CHROs where they say, hey, we've got this great new program. People aren't using it because they don't believe that they can do it. Yeah. And sometimes it takes storytelling. It takes... Fixing reward systems, sometimes the reward system gets in the way 
of somebody learning something new. Teaching managers that their job is to develop people, not just to get them to perform higher. There's all sorts of cultural things around that. Companies, though, that unlock this, um, I mean, the example, of course, is Microsoft, who is you know, well known, if you read Satya Nadella's book, when they adopted a growth mindset, their growth rate just tilted up at, a, you know, at, a, at an enormous rate. It's the most valuable company in the world now, and, and, and virtually every company can take advantage of that. And that's an interesting situation and context, because it's an organization that had been around for a long time, had been very successful, but recognized internally there was a need to kind of recalibrate the perspective They didn't recognize internally. it before Satya was the CEO, but now they recognize it. I think everybody in the business world is intimidated by the rate of change of whatever domain you're in. And what we do is to give the HR and L&D people an approachable source of information to learn themselves. But if you don't have access to our content or, or, or you're not paying attention to what we're doing, go to conferences, read books, talk to your peers in other companies, talk to the vendors. Even though most vendors are trying to sell you something, look at them as a way to learn because because the vendors are going to tell you about things that they're doing that you re might realize is a good idea that you hadn't thought of and experiment and, and get over the whatever the obstacles may be where you don't feel like you understand the domain well enough. I mean, when I got into L&D and training in the late 1990s, I thought it was pretty simple. 22, 23, 24 years later, I realized it's massively complicated. So when you jump into the domain of L&D and corporate training, you're jumping into a very deep pool with all sorts of wonderful people to learn from. So if you're willing to think about your job as also learning about your trade, not just helping everybody else learn. You're going to add more value every year and you're going to have a better and better career as time goes on. You're making me think about a quote from Einstein, which I'm going to butcher, but it's essentially is, as I've learned more, I recognize that there is more that I don't know and I right. think that can be very true. I'm humbled every year by things that I thought I knew a lot about that I kind of didn't quite understand completely. <laughs> and that is the story of life and the business of learning. <laughs> That's true. One more question for you, if you don't sure. mind. Josh, what are your top three predictions? Well, one for sure is that AI is going to absolutely revolutionize L&D and simplify a massive amount of technology the companies have, have been implementing. The second is L&D professionals are going to get more and more and more focused on human performance, what we might call soft skills or power skills, the things that aren't inferred by AI. So as AI gets better and better at sort of the knowledge management part of L&D, all of a sudden we're going to realize, oh, there's a whole bunch of other cultural things that we have to work on too because we won't be bogged down in some of that. Right. The third is I, I don't think there's any choice for CEOs, CHROs, and CFOs to invest more and more in this area. I mean, one of the clients we're working with right now is a large defense contractor in the UK, and they're a 55,000-person company. They make jet engines and you know missile systems and all of the information about how to do that is in the heads of baby boomers who are leaving. Oh, that's and so interesting. And the young engineers can't learn it fast enough. And the CEO has made it clear that if we can't solve this problem, we're not going to be around in 20 years. So getting money and investment and attention from C-level executives is happening and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So, so those of us in HR and L&D, we need to step it up and make sure we're, we're taking advantage of this opportunity. I'm so happy you gave that example. There is a story about how NASA and us as a collective lost the ability to go to the moon and largely because of a very similar problem. Yep. So I hope you were able to help that organization. <laughs> we're working on it. I hope we can do it too. I think we'll, we'll pull it off. Yeah. So top three, so AI, <laughs> human center skills, and ensuring the C-level executives really understand the criticality to their bottom line in business to invest in learning and development. Absolutely. Oh, what a pleasure chatting with you. I look forward to talking to you next year, and we can learn more about the predictions then. But AI maybe just will tell us the predictions at that point, right, maybe? Right, we'll just ask the AI. Perhaps. Yeah.